Okay, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to our uh, first lecture. I guess the last lecture of the summer, first lecture of the fall season. And I'm going to get started, if you'll forgive me, just a couple minutes before uh, 7 o'clock, because I do have uh, a really special lecture that it is my honor to chair this evening. And I don't want to rob any of you of that one additional question and answer at the end of which, uh, once our speaker gets finished with his presentation. So, without further ado, uh, I'm proud to announce new sponsors. We have both Vacheron Constantin and Blancpain have joined the Horological Society of New York as sponsors. Uh, this is support for many of the functions that we have. We have annual scholarships, we have traveling education, uh, the sponsors are greatly appreciated. Our traveling education courses are coming soon to Orange County. Uh, that, that class will be September 28th and 29th, hosted by Langenzene. San Francisco's class is October 5th and 6th, hosted by Shreve and Company. Washington, D.C. will be October 12th and 13th, hosted by McDowell Time. Okay. Uh, before we get to our video, uh, I, I want to point out that uh, we've got a great turnout for our first lecture back from summer, and we're very pleased to be working with Aldous Hodge recently, and, uh, you know, it's cliche to say that you're known by the company you keep, and for Aldous to be excited to be a member, we're excited to have him. So, uh, Carolina, if you could kill the lights in the room, I'm happy to present our promotional video featuring Aldous Hodge. Have you ever wondered what makes a watch tick? Or how about why there are 24 hours in a day? But what about the difference between a chronograph and a chronometer? Hey, I'm Aldous Hodge, and I'm here at the Horological Society of New York where you'll find out the answers to those questions and so much more. The Horological Society of New York is America's first watchmaking guild and one of the oldest horological institutions in the world. Today, the Society operates as an educational nonprofit organization with a mission to advance the art and science of watchmaking. Every month here in Midtown Manhattan, the Society hosts its acclaimed lecture series featuring expert speakers from around the world lecturing on technical, historical, and cultural aspects of horology. This lecture series is a New York tradition ongoing for over 150 years. The lectures take place in the Landmark General Society Library on Club Row here in the heart of Midtown Manhattan. Now upstairs in the same building, the Society hosts its world famous watchmaking classes. In these classes, you get a chance to disassemble and reassemble a mechanical watch with the help of professional watchmakers. These hands-on classes are a wonderful learning opportunity for anyone looking to really understand what makes a mechanical watch movement work. The same watchmaking classes are offered outside of New York City as a part of their traveling education initiative. The traveling classes spend a weekend in cities across the world, giving everyone a chance to experience the joy of horology. Every year in April, the Society celebrates its birthday with a gala and a charity auction. At the gala, the Henry B. Free Scholarship for American Watchmaking is awarded to deserving watchmaking students, and the charity auction sells an amazing collection of timekeepers, experiences, and horological ephemera. Whether you're a seasoned watch collector, a professional watchmaker, or an aspiring watchmaking student, the Horological Society of New York has something to offer you. I hope to see you at a class or a lecture soon. So we're really excited about that video. You're going to be seeing that uh, on fairly heavy rotation. We're promoting it and the society. Um, I got the signal during the film that I forgot to introduce myself. My name is John Tiefert, and uh, I'm the vice president of the New York Horological Association. And uh, Nick really has done so much work to bring the society to the point where it is. And he's done me a great honor of letting me uh, chair the first meeting back um, in no small part because I've got such a great respect for our speaker, Robert Cheney. I really wanted the privilege of introducing him to you. Now, uh, unfortunately for me, I had some competition from one of our fellow trustees, so 
This is maybe the first time ever where a speaker is going to have two introductions. So I'll keep mine quite short. Um, the last time I saw Robert, he was giving a absolutely brilliant talk at the Willard Museum. And for those of you here today or watching online that have never had the opportunity or taken the time to visit the Willard Museum, it is very much worth the trip. Uh, and Robert gave a talk. Uh, he had an audience about this size, and we were surrounded by some just treasures, some, some original Willard clocks, and he asked the audience to pick one and then proceeded to do an autopsy of this clock, taking off the hood, taking the movement out, the weights, the pendulum, uh, coming over to the carcass of the clock, hoisting his shoulder into it, picking it up, and putting it down on a table so that we can take a look at this clock from every possible angle, things that normally you would never get to see, and he made it look easy. So this is a small anecdote from uh, my experience with Robert and one of many because every time I've had the luck to speak with him, I've learned something truly brilliant that has made me look at not just clocks, but what I do for a living in a different light. So that's the end of my introduction. Uh, I'm pleased to al also share with all of you a message from Michael Friedman. Uh, Michael Friedman, for those of you who don't know, he's the head of complications at Omar Piguet. Uh, he's a trustee on the board with me for the Horological Society of New York. And he would be chairing the meeting tonight if he weren't physically in Switzerland. So he sent this message uh, from 3,000 miles away for us to share. Good evening, friends and colleagues at the Horological Society of New York. It's uh, a real treat you have coming up for you this evening, a uh, talk by none other than Mr. Robert Cheney. A lot of people don't know uh, Robert was my very first mentor in this field, in this business, over 23 years ago when we first met. Everything I know stems from those early times and lessons with Robert. Let me just sum it up a little bit. Treating horology as a true academic subject, seeking first-generation documentation, putting together sound theories based on real evidence and real observations, understanding the originality as well as the potential restoration of all components pertaining to a horological object, realizing that case style and movement have their own evolutionary threads, their own story, and to become a master of all three entities to really understand an object and its historical path. Robert is like no other in this business. I can't even begin to tell you his contributions. Among them, my favorites are his phenomenal work overseeing and assisting with clocks at the White House, as well as him putting together the very first Longitude Symposium back in the mid-90s, which helped really share the story of John Harrison with the wider world. In my own career and business, I wouldn't be here today uh, if it weren't for Robert. Not only did he give me so much opportunity and so many lessons early on, he was instrumental in my, own, uh, in my own career in terms of my position at the National Watch and Clock Museum many, many years ago. Robert co-curated exhibitions with me. And really, if it weren't for Robert, I wouldn't be around here today. He's the real deal. He's, in my mind, the first scholar in the modern age of horology. He's changed the game in so many respects. You're gonna see that tonight. You're gonna explore that tonight. Ask him any questions you could think of. In addition to being a true horological scholar and the man who knows more than anyone alive about the Willard family and general Massachusetts horology, as well as beyond, he's also a fun, wonderful man, and I wish I could be there to give him a big hug tonight. So lots of love to you all. Enjoy, and see you soon. So with that, Please join me in a huge round of applause for our speaker, Mr. Robert Cheney. All right, I guess I'll go home now. Uh, after that, uh, thank you very much, John. And what a surprise for me to 
hear from my dear friend Michael Friedman, uh, although he claims to be, uh, you know, a product of, of my um, teaching and so on, he's a sharp, sharp guy. And if it wasn't me, it would have been someone else who could certainly guide him in the direction he needed uh, to go. So someday I do hope to meet up with him. And I understand congratulations are in order to him because he has just had a, a new baby in his family. So, uh, so thank you both, John and Michael, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, we are going to be uh, talking about a subject tonight that I must say, when I first started to talk about this subject, I uh, got a deaf ear in a lot of clock circles. Um, I got a deaf ear because it was just plain and simple, not the story that clock makers and clock collectors wanted to hear. And uh, sadly, it was a story um, that uh, had been brewing in my mind for a long time, and every time I would read the latest horological scholarship on American clocks, I would, you know, just sort of smirk and say, you know, when are they ever going to get it right? And uh, finally, um, through a uh, small grant, I was able to be a scholar in residence at the Concord, Massachusetts uh, Museum and was able to finally have a paycheck while I wasn't either restoring clocks or appraising them or lecturing about them or whatever. So that happened back in April of 2000. And my treatise was on the Willard painted dial clocks, just like what you're looking at here. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the Willard clocks as the uh, century moved on to 1800, and the Willard clocks had moved to Roxbury uh, from their very rural home in Grafton, Massachusetts. The birth of the painted dial clocks was an explosion for the manufacture of clocks for a growing population. In Boston alone, between 1800 and 1825, 24,000 people moved to town, keeping in mind that there were only 2,000 people that had moved to town between the mid-18th century and 1800. So after 1800, it was a tremendous, tremendous boom. We will not be talking about the brass dial clocks, although the story that I will be telling you applies to the brass dial clocks just as well as it applies to the painted dial clocks. Here you see the great masterpiece by James Waddy of Newport about 1750 uh, with title dial up in the uh, upper left hand uh, corner, uh, strike silent in the upper right hand corner, of course moon's age dial. So these were the types of dials that we saw on eight day clocks as the makers used to call them. We call them today tall clocks, hall clocks, floor clocks, long case clocks. What did the makers call them? They called them eight-day clocks, plain and simple, because they knew that a clock meant bell in many different languages. So if they called it an eight-day clock, the average person knew exactly what they were talking about. They didn't call them grandfather clocks until 1876, when Henry Clay Work wrote that celebrated song, My Grandfather's Clock. It was at that time that that sheet music sold for over 800,000 copies that the term grandfather clock became known for the type of clock we'll be talking about tonight. And we're not talking about Willard's patent timepiece. The timepiece that he uh, received a patent for in 1802, and Willard knew the difference between the word clock and the word timepiece. The word timepiece means it does not strike the hours, it doesn't have a bell inside there. So in 1802, he got a patent for his patent timepiece, which became an incredible success in the uh, new uh, blooming business in downtown Boston. 
The patent timepiece story is one that I've been working on for a while now, and it will be uh, completed uh, sometime uh, long after my death uh, when I can actually have the accurate story of how these clocks were really made, because it's terribly complicated, although it couldn't be more complicated than the one that I'm going to tell you about the tall clocks. The Willard House and Clock Museum uh, started, um, for me anyway, when I was six years old. And my dad brought me to this rundown place uh, in a place on the old maps in Grafton that they call Wildcat Swamp. Uh, it was a desolate area in Grafton. It was highly uh, um, isolated and still is today. Part of the fun is getting there. Um, if you want to come for a visit, uh, it's best to have a good GPS, a good map, uh, maybe a couple of days worth of provisions and, and a tent. And uh, you'll be sure to uh, get there just fine right out of the center uh, of Grafton. This is the clock shop uh, that my father, uh, Bradford Cheney, the clockmaker, um, wanted to preserve and wanted to save. And he was involved in a number of years in trying to get this uh, clock shop moved to an outdoor history museum in Massachusetts called Old Sturbridge Village. Uh, and he tried to do that through the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors. He never really succeeded in that for money reasons. Uh, so as a result, the clock shop was still there in 1957 uh, when you see these two adorable children outside. And um, one, uh, there is me. So the other side of that uh, afternoon, we went to visit the Willard clock that was upstairs in the belfry of the Grafton Church. And high in the belfry of this 18th century church is another Aaron Willard Jr. tower clock. And I think my dad put some dirt on my hands and a little dirt on my face and then took my picture to give the idea that I was actually working on this thing. But I can assure you it was actually quite dangerous to climb up this uh, steeple uh, with rickety stairs and railings about ready to fall off uh, just to examine this. You can see the bailing wire and all sorts of contraptions trying to hold this together prior to uh, my dad restoring it. The museum today uh, is a product of Dr. and Mrs. Robinson, who founded the place, uh, bought it in the late 60s, and started it as a museum in 1971. It's now the homestead restored to its original salt box construction. Uh, the clock shop you can see there between the salt box house and the barn. And um, out back behind this general uh, antique facade are several large galleries where we display somewhere upwards of 87 masterpiece uh, Willard clocks. When Simon Willard uh, put his labels on the inside of these mahogany clocks right around 1796, he had a staggering list of things that he was offering to the, to the public. Uh, he was offering uh, clocks for steeples with one, two, or three dials, common eight-day clocks with elegant faces in mahogany cases. That's what we're looking at here. 50 to $60. Timepieces, that's the patent timepiece or the so-called banjo clock. 30-hour timepieces, those were only $10. Spring clocks of all kinds, clocks that will run a year with one winding up, uh, clocks for astronomical purposes, timepieces for meeting houses, chime clocks that play six tunes in a psalm on Sunday, and even perambulators when they're affixed to the wheel of a carriage, it would tell you how far you had traveled. And one could only imagine that Simon Willard must have been a very busy guy. After he moved to Boston and Roxbury by 1800, because to offer that staggering list of amenities related to the clock world, uh, he had to have been a remarkable 
fast worker. The clock shop, as we show it here today uh, at the museum, uh, unfortunately only shows two items that were originally owned by the Willards. Um, there's very little archival material that survives from the Willards, unfortunately. There's a lot of bills of sale, uh, there's some letters, um, but there's no journeyman or memorandum books uh, that would make a historian's life a lot easier. But at the museum, we do show uh, the tools uh, that a typical 18th century uh, clockmaker would have uh, utilized. Um, but what we don't have a lot of, and we wish we did, was something that the Connecticut Historical Society has, and these are actually documented templates uh, for various components, for casting brass, uh, for laying out patterns on steel, for making hands, um, and a variety of other components uh, for the eight-day uh, tall clocks. This uh, practice that we represent in the Willard Clock Shop at the museum is traditional clock making, or what I have dubbed clock making the hard way. And I mean the hard way. Daniel Burnap of Norwich, Connecticut, as you see on the screen, utilized templates, jigs, fixtures, he did the casting, he made the dials, he did the engraving, he did it all. And that is clock making the hard way. That's in the watchmaking sense, that's watchmaking the George Daniels way, if you will. Uh, it's just as complicated and as difficult as that. But Burnap had a memorandum book uh, where it showed his designs for dials. It showed the various um, wheel uh, sizes and numbers of wheel and pinions. It showed patterns for everything related to Roman numerals, to the sketches of the various components of the um, front plate lifting work for the strike train. So if you study the memorandum book and you look at a burnout clock in person, you will be able to tell that, yes, that's a burnout clock because the components in the clock that you're looking at that dates 1785 or so matches these patterns and these jigs, these fixtures, these templates, these uh, castings and so on <clears throat> that survive from the Burnap holdings at the Connecticut Historical Society. Another case in point as a traditional clockmaker, and this was the Dominey family uh, down on Long Island, and the Dominies like Daniel Burnap and Thomas Harlan in Norwich, Connecticut, they were making clocks the hard way. They made their templates, they made their jigs, they made their fixtures, they cast their uh, brass, they cast the lead for weights, they made their own hands, and in the case of the Dominies, a rare occurrence, they actually made their own cases. And um, you can either love some of these cases or hate them uh, because of their rather humble nature. But these were rural clockmakers working in a void, working in very unpopulated areas. And as I say, making clocks the hard way under really very difficult situations. But the point here is that the templates actually match the finished product. So that knowing that these Domini templates exist at the Winotour Museum in, in uh, Delaware, um, and you see a clock plate, uh, a clock movement that has that sort of configuration to it, you can pretty much determine that that clock you're looking at was made by one of the Dominies. <laughs> But with Willard's, this is just not so, particularly painted dial Willard clocks. 
Uh, this one on the screen uh, with a Birmingham dial uh, depicts the four seasons in the corners. It has moon's age up above, has uh, the calendar here, and also the seconds bit, and it's numbered number 1,585. So do these numbers mean that this is the 1,585th clock that Simon Willard made? I can tell you I've documented these numbers, and I must say, yeah, that's what it's telling you. These numbers are chronological. The earlier numbers seem to be in the earlier cases. The later the numbers on the dial, or the higher the numbers on the dial, the more uh, federal-looking the cases are with inlay and, and all of that sort of thing. So it is kind of what it's telling you. So how can a guy make 1,585 eight-day clocks, not to mention his patent timepieces, his shelf clocks, his clocks that go for a year on a winding, his clocks for astronomical purposes, his clocks for steeple, his perambulators, and all of that stuff, when guys like Burnap and the Dominies on Long Island could only produce over a 20-year period about 50 clocks in their entire career. That was the best they could do making clocks the hard way, was 50 clocks. So obviously, Willard wasn't making clocks the hard way. But everyone wanted to believe Willard was making clocks the hard way because they loved the story, they loved the nostalgia about the clockmaker sitting there tapping away at his bench with the little apprentice lad there, you know, filing some parts or sweeping the floor. But I can tell you that that story was far from the truth by 1800 in Roxbury. I first thought that the story might lay in Birmingham because of all these Birmingham painted dials that were on Willard clocks, you know, made by Wilson, James Wilson, or Thomas Osborne, or a variety of other different makers, but those were the two dial makers that were most prominent on Willard clocks. So I went and started my investigations there at the Winotour uh, Library and in the Birmingham uh, Library as well, and found that I could not find evidence that that's where these components and parts and fixtures were coming from. <clears throat> Birmingham trade catalogs are known throughout the decorative arts industry as some of the most interesting viewing possible. They're big folio kind of books, and these parts and fixtures are generally shown full size in these catalogs. Here you see an assortment of finials. Uh, another example from one of these Birmingham trade catalogs, and this is the only one I know of that actually mentions clocks. Uh, here they were advertising on the front cover house bells, <clears throat> clockwork. Uh, let's see, what does that say? Clock, clock something, clockwork and um, dog collars. Uh, I had to repair an 18th century dog collar one time, and my God, <clears throat> I spent more time on that. It's no wonder that I never could earn a living as a clock restorer. But despite this rather tempting cover, and it's the only part that survives, that talks about clockwork, and clock bells, I guess is the next uh, word there, um, <clears throat> I didn't find anything else because there was nothing else in the document. So let's back up a little bit. We've, we have dials coming out of Birmingham, England, and they were coming out in very large numbers, and they had the so-called false plate or the back plate, which was an intermediate plate made of iron that was mounted between the front plate of the movement and the back of the dial. And what that mounting plate did was it allowed a clockmaker from Timbuktu 
to mount his movement to a Birmingham dial with only one important consideration. All that clockmaker had to do in 1800 was remember to design his movements with these three dimensions um, always the same. Because the Birmingham dial came through with those three dimensions already drilled in the dial, so you needed to make your movement have those same dimensions, those same angles in order to fit a Birmingham dial. But <clears throat> that wasn't hard. It became really uh, a, a standardization that took all of about a year and a half before it seemed like everybody was making their movements with those three determinations in mind in order to be mounted uh, to a Birmingham dial. So it was the Birmingham dial that made the uh, Willard and many, many other makers of painted dial clocks explode with the, both the quantity and the quality. And I'll tell you why about the quality in a minute. <clears throat> well, you may wonder, you know, painted dials were first seen in America about 1781. They were seen in England by 1772 by James Wilson and Thomas Osborne. But who do you suppose was the first guy in America to ever advertise the painted clock dial? It was none other than the British are coming, the British are coming, and they're bringing painted white dials with them. Paul Revere himself. Paul Revere, it's a, the story of Paul Revere is a wonderful one if you delve into it. He was a remarkable uh, general tradesman. Yeah, he made silver bowls and porringers and all that stuff. But he very quickly tried to get away from the bench. And I will say that that's one common characteristic with most craftsmen, regardless of the trade, that I have studied during the 18th century. They had one thing in mind, and they wanted to get the hell away from the bench. Now, I'm sorry to say that story here in, in this building because we want to get everybody going back to the bench. But these guys knew that they were not going to be making money like their merchant friends that they know at church if they stay working at the bench. There's only so many hours in a day, and there's only so many days in a week. So in order to do that, they need to get away from the bench, and they need to start manufactories. They call them manufactories uh, of one sort or another. But here you see another back of the dial, back of the painted Wilson. I think in this case, it's an Osborne dial. <clears throat> I tried for a long time to get the decorative arts world to start to be familiar with the painted dial clocks so at least they could maybe describe them accurately in literature. So I put this out about 20 years ago, describing all the various parts so that when um, various clockmakers had things that needed to be replaced, you know, they, we could all start calling things by the same name. And I didn't make up this nomenclature. I used the same nomenclature wherever I could of the clockmakers, the same way that they were describing this stuff, and the same names that they called these things by. And if I couldn't find an 18th century uh, name for it, I used a commonly used name from as early as I could find. Some of this terminology came about around 1900 when books started to be written uh, about clocks and watches, watch repair. So uh, I used the best terminology I could possibly uh, get to put together this little chart. And um, I'm going to have to uh, go back and uh, um, put pen to paper again because I'm afraid my first attempts over the last 20 years were not terribly successful. Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button here. <clears throat> 
So how were these clocks really made? You know, I laid the groundwork here to tell you that Willard had to be the superstar of the world to make all of this stuff during his, you know, 20 or 30 year career. How were these clocks really made? If you're making it the hard way, you'd need to cast the parts that you see there on the right. You'd have to forge the steel parts for the rack and the rack tail and, and the uh, lifting levers and rack holder and all that sort of thing. But uh, that's a lot of work. I think any clockmakers in the room, uh, that's a lot of work, isn't it? I mean, it's horrible. Uh, I've done it, and I can say that uh, if you want to try to make a living at it, making one part at a time as you're making these things is not going to work. So I got into the project of studying, and again, I chose Willard clocks because they were the biggest name in the painted dial world that I could deal with uh, in my study, which began, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago. I used Willard clocks. I always used Willard clocks that were authentic, and I always used Willard clocks that could be dated within about three to five years of each other. So these, despite the different looks of these uh, two dials, one is a Wilson dial, and the one on the left is a, an Osborne dial, but they were both made about 1792. They're both completely authentic. They're both in completely authentic cases. They both have labels or bills of sale, so that I know I'm comparing apples with apples. And then when you, um, when you uh, start to pull the dials off of these things, they're basically completely different. Now, I have stressed to the non-clockmakers of the world that you too can participate in this study, and you don't have to be a clockmaker. You don't have to know how to take a clock apart to do this study. Just look at the front plate work, the striking work on these eight-day clocks. And just look at the shapes of these levers. Because if these parts are shaped differently, that means they're mounted differently. And initially, for me to come to this conclusion, I would Xerox copy the plates and I would do it on mylar so that I could sort of index the mylar and see when these plates were exactly the same by mounting these front plates. So forget about how many wheels, uh, how many teeth are on the wheels and what the measurements are and all that stuff. You don't need any of that stuff in order to determine what I'm talking about here today. And we're going to be talking about how these clocks were really made, and that is they were made by the Lancashire method of a finely divided trade. Uh, here's two Aaron Willard clocks. Again, the same parameters This made within two years of each other, both uh, particularly authentic clocks, uh, both, interestingly enough, have the product of Birmingham, uh, the heart-shaped hands. Um, both just wonderful clocks, and they're in wonderful cases. But we're not talking about the cases today. And then when we go to the front plate, remember again, we're only talking shapes here. When the shapes are different uh, of this, these parts, their mounting is different and that indicates a different set of fixtures, a different set of templates, and a different layout. And unless you're the dumbest clockmaker in the world, you wouldn't make one one day like that, and the next day like that, because you'd have to redesign the wheel every single day, and you would be making clocks really the hard way, if that's the way you were trying to do it. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the, the story uh, with the painted dial clock is, you know, like the story of the common pin. Not the common pin that you know of today, but the 18th century common pin. 
And I, I thank my scholar friend and colleague, David Wood of the Concord Museum, for, for this analogy. And it would be only a guy of David Wood's intellect. Maybe Michael Friedman could get away with it. But David pointed out to me that in Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in 1805, Adam Smith said that an unskilled craftsman could probably make 20 of these common pins in a day. And as the more skilled you got, maybe you could make 22 or 23, but, you know, it wouldn't increase dramatically. Um, and he outlined 18 different operations to make a common pin from the 18th century. One to draw the wire, one to straighten it, one to cut it, one to point it, one to grind it to receive the head. Two or three different operations to make the head. Um, one to put on the, uh, uh, to, uh, let's see, one to put on the head, one to whiten it or harden it, uh, one to put it uh, on the cardboard the way they sold it. That was a separate trade in 1805, to take a common pin and put it in a piece of cardboard so that you could market it. That's my kind of trade. I think you could probably learn that in ah, maybe two or three weeks. You could probably figure that out. But um, so if it took 18 or so different operations, probably at least nine different trades. These are distinctly different trades. Nine different trades to make a common pin in 1805. How many do you suppose there were involved in making an eight-day clock? Well, surprisingly, I happen to know that, too. About 17. Um, just about the same number as a common pin. Uh, Abraham Reese, in his uh, Encyclopedia of, uh, of the Crafts, uh, describes 17 different trades in making, this, uh, making the average clock. But that story is in Liverpool. That story is not on this side of the Atlantic. So I began my study uh, in uh, Liverpool. Uh, most of this material was at the Birmingham Public Library. And I looked at the papers of Peter Stubbs. He was a large um, merchant in Liverpool, selling a variety of different things uh, for the trades. Now, uh, Peter Stubbs had his hand in all of those Birmingham trade catalogs. He could market all of those finials, hinges in 85 different sizes, finials of a dozen different sizes. Here they are, full scale in the book. Uh, you could buy a scutcheons in dozens of different sizes, buy them by the number. So, so that aspect of the trade is pretty well taken care of. We know how the cabinet makers work. But it was not until we started to delve into the papers of Peter Stubbs of Warrington, just outside of Liverpool, uh, that I finally figured out how, how the average uh, clock trade operated at this time. Liverpool, of course, was one of the largest uh, port cities uh, in the world. Um, it had, uh, by 1850, it had uh, a port that could accommodate 5,000 ships annually. Huge, huge uh, trade coming through this port city. Um, at the time, um, there was a description of uh, Liverpool uh, from the 18th century that described the waterfront as a terribly overcrowded, filthy place filled with wretched souls trudging through um, muck and dirt and breathing very foul air. Now, that sounds like just the place that you'd find a clockmaker, doesn't it? Not a watchmaker, but it's just the place that you would find a clockmaker for sure. Um, especially if there's a pub on every corner. But... If we go on to talk about uh, Liverpool and the surrounding area of Liverpool, such as Prescott, which is within a few miles of Liverpool, 
and the separate trades, the divided trades that we see. From these old pictures, uh, you can see uh, north-facing sides of houses that carry a bank of lights, uh, windows, um, that would provide natural light to individual tradesmen working in these faces. Here you see another actual workshop uh, from the early 19th century uh, in uh, the tiny town of Prescott. And the numbers of workers in these, in these towns was just astronomical. Uh, at one count, uh, early in the 19th century, uh, workshops were attached to one half of all households. Uh, these workshops were manned by specialist craftsmen producing clock and watch parts, tools, and finished timekeepers for the trade. It's been said by John Griffiths of the uh, Prescott Museum, he states that pinion wire for watches was made by the mile in this town. So this is the place to be if you really wanted to find out about watch and clock making in the early 19th century. In a tiny town in Oglet, which was nearby Prescott, nearby Liverpool, there were only, uh, only 12 houses on one of the streets, and seven of them were watchmakers. Um, Dennis Moore, who's an independent, was an independent uh, researcher in Liverpool, sadly he's passed away now, he documented over 20,000 journeymen in the Liverpool area that had never before been documented. 20,000. They never, most of these had never had their name on a clock or a watch. Most of them were just unknown journeymen doing some aspect of the trade of clockwork or watchwork. 20,000 in addition to those we already know. And when I was chatting with him, he had only been at it for three years. And he spent another 10 before he passed away uh, documenting that. So how did this trade operate over there? First of all, you had to have a, you know, a tool catalog. And John White, who was uh, a resident of uh, Prescott, he's buried there, in fact, he had the first horological tool catalog uh, in the world about 1784. And it advertised dozens and dozens and dozens of files, as you would expect, uh, screw plates and taps and a multitude of different sizes. You'll notice that they're all numbered um, so that you could order the numbered size that suited your work uh, the best. The one in the upper left-hand corner was obviously for watches because it's smallest of all, and um, corresponding taps for all of these uh, screw plates uh, that carry Peter Stubbs' name on it, although Peter Stubbs didn't actually make these things. Pliers and dozens of varieties, all kinds of different ends on them. I mean, here's just on the right side of this, uh, you know, just kind of nippers of one, one sort or another. Big, small, special, diagonal cut, straight cut. I mean, you name it, just order it by the number out of the John White catalog. About the most complicated thing that they offered in the catalog of John White uh, in the 1780s was a, <clears throat> a uh, center lathe, and this was a hand-powered device, and you would mount your work between centers. I'm sure all of you know of that technique. And the center lathe was, a, uh, was the, one of the most complicated uh, objects that these specialists would own. Um, one of the others, of course, was a wheel-cutting engine. Large for clockmakers, small for watchmakers. Another tool, not terribly complicated, but this one right out of the white uh, catalog was a barrel grooving engine, as they called it. So it would um, n not carve, but it would uh, use a graver to come in contact with the barrel, and it would 
uh, do the grooves where the line goes over the barrel and the weight climbs up inside the clock case so that you wouldn't, as you're winding, so that that cord didn't go jumping off of the barrel and ended up, you know, in a mess, a bird's nest in between the plate and the arbor. Um, we have actually two of these uh, at Willard. Uh, we're very pleased to have them, two fairly different designs. Uh, they both came out of the Ted Crom Horological Tool Collection, which in one of my other lives as a um, auction specialist for school Skinner, I had the privilege of selling uh, Ted Crom's horological tool collection. But this is the key right here. This is what's known as a clock set. And the clock set was made by the 17 different people who are the tradesmen. There's the brass founder, there's the so-called clocksmith, he was doing the uh, iron and steel work, there's the wheel cutter, there's the pinion maker, there's uh, the uh, clock finisher who was kind of, you know, polishing the whole thing up at the end if you were gonna bring it to that point. Uh, there's the, um, you name it, the spring maker for the springs that the uh, hammer to hit the bell uh, retract on. Um, and that was it. You could order a clock set from Liverpool, from Peter Stubbs, and you could walk down the street from Simon Willard's house about a half, a quarter of a mile, you could walk into either Davis and Brown's establishment or you could walk into John McFarland's jewelry in uh, clock and watch warehouse and say, I want a clock set. But never mind, I'll take a half dozen clock sets and I'd like, a, I'd like five completed movements. You could get the completed movements all done, all polished up, mounted with a dial on there, and inscribed with the maker's name, all the way from Liverpool. How long did that take? You walk down the street, you put the order in, he puts it on the next packet, going over to Liverpool. It's about 25 days to get over there with good luck. He places the order, the order is filled within the week, Boom, 25 more days, he's back over in Boston, and a little kid comes running into Simon Willard's shop there in, on uh, Washington Street in Roxbury and says, sir, sir, your order is in. And that was it. A couple of months with good luck, and granted, they needed a lot of good luck because we had some pretty foul weather as we do today out in the ocean. And any of those storms could easily sink some of these uh, packets. This is the only known clock set, by the way, that I know about. And I uh, only know about it because I had been reading in the archives about clock sets, clock sets, you know, 42 shillings for a clock set. I said, what the heck is a clock set? And I kind of pieced it together that it's probably like a clock kit. And I had lectured on this subject for years, you know, all over the place, trying to have someone say, hey, you know, I've got one of those things. It belonged to my grandfather. It's under my bench for the last 30 years, and I'd love to have you look at it. Well, actually, that happened. And uh, someone out in Ohio says, you know, I think I have one of those. And sure enough, he did, and here it is. And it's, to my knowledge, the only known clock set I'm sure there are others somewhere. I would love to know about them. Uh, this clock set is now at the American Clock and Watch Museum so that it can be examined by future scholars. But here you see the, uh, the brass founder at work and marking his name there. That's George Ainsworth of Warrington. He was working right nearby Liverpool. And so he was one of those 17 different uh, trades involved in making this. He was the brass founder. And here you see the clock set version. And after it has gone through the various stages 
um, by the finisher and so on, then it would end up as a finished movement. Pinions, what a lovely story pinions are. Uh, you've got to be a real clock nut to say something like that. But let me tell you, <clears throat> there is such a story about pinions that it, it would be a PhD if anybody wants to tackle it. Pinions are something that had to be, for a quality pinion, it had to be high quality steel. What's the best steel at the time? Sheffield steel. They had all of that that they wanted just outside of Liverpool, so they made pinions of Sheffield steel, and this pin these pinions went all over the world. These are clock pinions. I think there's seven to a set. It even has the original wrapper, how these things uh, came. And, um, <clears throat> but pinions were also attempted to be made in America. So if you're a clockmaker in this room and you're trying to work on an 18th century clock and you said, oh my God, who the heck, you know, cut these pinions, they're awful. Well, chances are those were the American equivalent of what you could buy in Liverpool. In Liverpool, you were buying top of the line. And you see them here in the unfinished uh, state. They're simply slotted by the pinion making machine. And then they would uh, go through a process, either a mechanical process or a hand filing process to bring them uh, back to the proper shape. And then they would have to, of course, be hardened. But Sheffield steel could be hardened, softened, hardened, softened many times during the process of making a pinion. So it worked out just beautifully uh, <clears throat> for that purpose. So please, uh, if you ever get your PhD in pinions, uh, please let me know because I would love to, love to read it. Uh, in 1817, the firm of Davis and Brown in Boston uh, placed an order from Peter Stubb uh, for 24 eight-day clock movements. Those are all, those are all done. Uh, 12 sets of eight-day cast work, that's sort of the clock set. Uh, and later ordered another 30 sets of the cast work. Uh, six dozen sets of eight-day clock forged work, that's the steel, rough castings, and finished movements. Later, the same firm of Davis and Brown uh, accepted an order to buy from Peter Stubbs in Liverpool enough pinions to make 602 eight-day clocks. So you see how big this industry was. And you could buy the clock set completely unfinished. You could buy a clock set that was kind of finished. You could buy a clock set that had been turned into a finished clock with a dial on it and your American name on it. You could buy any variety of those things if you were Simon Willard working in Roxbury in Boston. So you wonder how Simon Willie can make 1,585 clocks. That's one way to do it. That ain't making clocks the hard way. That's earning a living and doing it the business way. Uh, you know, Henry Ford didn't make the hubcaps, uh, and the space shuttle does not fly all on the basis of one person. Um, you know, this was a finely divided trade, identical except for size, of the finely divided trade of watches at the same period, of course. The watch story has been out there for a long time, but for some reason, clock people haven't been willing to accept uh, the similarities. Of course, you, uh, to um, uh, represent a little bit of what's involved, you get the brass uh, casting from the uh, brass founder. Uh, you would start by turning this uh, with one of the next trades. The wheel cutting would go on by a third trade. Pinion work would come uh, in the sort of unfinished state, then it was slit, then it was shaped, and then mounted by one of those various uh, craftsmen in the hierarchy of the trade. 
And here you see just a wild assortment of uh, the various components, you know, pallet cocks, uh, uh, pulleys, flies, keys, both in the finished and unfinished uh, variety. Here is that the shapes of the, that front plate lifting work we talk about. And here is George Ainsworth working in three different divisions of the trade. One is a brass founder, one as a clocksmith or a whitesmith, and then another as a bell founder. He had a big operation over there and uh, ran a tremendous business uh, for clock and watchmakers. And the various components of the great wheel. You see the uh, finished product up there along the top and the various components as it was found in this clock set uh, down below. So who's this guy, John McFarlane? He ran an outfit called Wholesale and Retail Clock and Watch and Jewelry Warehouse in Boston. Um, well, he was a guy who you'd go to if you wanted to order any of this stuff. You know, you name it. Uh, he would be able to supply this uh, to you at almost a moment's notice. Now, one thing I would like to point out here is that this is a, a trade card from 1812, right in the height of what we're talking about here, the year uh, duration of what we're talking. Um, notice what was one of the, I call it the glue that held the trade together. Notice the iconography here. Um, and if you follow this sort of thing, you'll know that this is Masonic iconography. They were all Masons, as far as I could tell. So if you were on one side of the Atlantic doing hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of, worth of business with Peter Stubbs on the other side of the Atlantic, how did you know that guy was going to pay you? Well, he's one of my brothers. He's a Mason. So Masonry, in my opinion, was one of the ways that that held that business together. And of course, <clears throat> McFarlane, you could also buy watches from him as well, finished watches uh, that were certainly not made by McFarlane, John McFarlane Boston with numbers on them. <clears throat> I mean, I think all of you will agree that this is right out of Liverpool in a nice gold case uh, with a diamond end stone, a detached lever uh, escapement uh, watch in a gold case with John McFarlane's name on it. So there you see again the merchant in Boston who is representing himself in this case as a watchmaker. But maybe he's really not representing himself that way. Maybe he's really representing himself as the dealer who is selling that. So we need to kind of think that over a little bit before we say things like McFarlane, just because his name is on the back plate of a movement, was the uh, actual manufacturer. Willard's had a big, big, big business. Uh, Aaron Willard uh, owned this house. <clears throat> he was Simon Willard's brother, and it was right on Washington Street in Boston. If you went on this side of the Roxbury line, which was right here, you would have Simon Willard's place. And if you are on the Boston side of the uh, Roxbury line, you would have Aaron's place. Now, wouldn't you think that this guy, he, that's quite an outfit there. I mean, that's a pretty fancy place. He called it on his labels, Aaron Willard's Manufactory. Well, okay, so you, you would imagine manufactory, the guy's a clockmaker, he's manufacturing clocks, meaning making clocks, but there's only two clockmakers in that whole structure there. One was Aaron Willard, and one was his son, Aaron Willard Jr., according to the records. Who were the other people populating this structure? Dial painters, gilders, carvers, cabinet makers, that was the rest of the story. People who could paint dials, paint decorative uh, glasses, who could uh, make cases. And in fact, you could fit from his headquarters here, or right over here, and there was another whole long line of cabinet makers working right there within what Aaron Willard called his manufactory. 
But the only thing that we need to keep in mind, he wasn't really manufacturing clock movements there. No, he had that all figured out. Either he was utilizing the Liverpool system in some way or the American version of that Liverpool finely uh, divided trade. And there was a, um, an attempt to be made early in the 19th century for America to recreate that Liverpool model. So here we have it all done, you know, the uh, Liverpool movement, actually this one uh, is marked uh, in very, very tiny uh, letters, Robert Roscal, Liverpool. Uh, so they're making no secret about it, other, other than you have to have incredible vision to see this signature. And on the front of the dial, it says Aaron Willard and beautiful Samuel Fisk case with a rocking ship dial and offered to the public for 50 to $60, probably with the rocking ship, which would go back and forth with the tick of the pendulum. It was probably $60 rather than $50, a slight add-on uh, to the price. But here's old Simon Willard. Um, you know, this was a guy who insisted that apprentices sign on the dotted line a document that said, you will preserve the art and mystery of making clocks and related tools. And I'm suggesting today that we now know a little bit more about the mystery. A little bit more about the mystery was that we don't make all this stuff. We just kind of make the whole thing happen by putting it all together. And that might be a little of the art and mystery that Willard is talking about. And as we see here in my final slide of Meeting House Hill in Roxbury, where Simon Willard went to church, uh, this is the first church of Roxbury. It was the epicenter of a group of artisans described as a group working in clannish and collaborative fashion who comprised one of the largest assemblages of talent in the history of American decorative arts. And I can tell you from my examination, that is saying it mildly. What Simon Willett observed in the division of labor in Lancaster, he brought over here uh, to America and tried to recreate that on Meeting House Hill. And for the most part, he was very successful at that uh, until the uh, rage of cheap clocks coming from Connecticut. For that, I thank you. So, question. Oh, sorry. Who's got questions? Nick. First off, that was a fascinating lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just interested. What was the public's perception of where these clocks were being made? What did they think of this mystery? Did they think everything was being made in the manufactory? Well, you can get at that by um, some of the advertisements that you find. And earlier, a little earlier than when the Willards were working, but um, the mid-18th century, you would see advertisements that they say they have clocks of the neatest fashion, of the best quality, and cheaper than you could buy in London, or cheaper than you could buy on the continent. So <clears throat> initially, I think they tried to um, get the business because it was cheaper. And then later on, they emphasized the quality. And depending on you know, whether you were an American supporter during the uh, Revolutionary War or an English supporter, they would sort of change their advertising to accommodate who, who they felt that their, their clientele was. But um, at least in the early days, it was not a plus to be made in America. But by 1800, I suspect it was. Other questions? Yes. 
Yes, that, that's a good question. Uh, there were shortcuts. Uh, here I'm showing a Boston dial. Uh, it, by, by 1800, some of these Boston artisans, um, Aaron Willard's son, for example, Aaron Willard Jr., um, started doing painted dials. And um, you can tell by the distinctive raised gesso and gilded work, that was one of his characteristics. But let's go back to uh, the Birmingham white dial, as they called it, or enamel dial, what they called it. Uh, and in those days, there was one artist who did the Roman numerals, another artist who did the Arabic numerals, another artist who did the, the raised gesso work, a final artist, uh, not final, but another artist who painted the gold on the raised gesso work. And the painting, depending on whether it was scenic like this or perhaps, you know, stars and, and a blue background uh, with a moon dial or something like that, uh, they had separate artists for that too. So you could be working in a dial uh, painting factory in Birmingham and there's probably six, eight, ten different artists involved in that. Same way, finely divided trade. Other questions? How many people were in the factories? Because when they're buying the kits, they obviously had to finish them because they're rough, there was no teeth, so there still had to be manufacturing. Here. Right. Between Simon and Aaron, how many people did they actually have working during their heyday? That's the great unknown, because many of these journeymen, and, and Simon and Aaron, um, Ephraim Willard, and Benjamin, were the four brothers, but Simon and Aaron are the two important ones in terms of this story that we're telling. Um, they obviously had journeymen. They needed journeymen to finish these clock sets, despite the fact that they could buy them finished uh, but if they had journeymen, chances are it would have been cheaper to finish them by a journeyman. Uh, we're finding out more and more journeymen. Uh, we're a bit like Dennis Moore when he starts to investigate the Lancashire clock and watch industry. We haven't found 20,000 yet, uh, but we're finding a lot of journeymen. Um, I skipped over the uh, potential story of the patent timepiece and how they were made. And um, as a little preview to that, that was not Willard there, you know, cutting teeth himself and filing plates. He or member of his um, uh, shop would bring a bunch of brass up to New Hampshire and there was a group of artisans, uh, clockmakers up there, again, utilizing this finely divided concept. And there was a guy cutting wheels, another one doing pinions, another one brass foundry and so on. So Willard was having the stuff made in one instance that I've discovered and having it made in New Hampshire. And then he'd go up, he'd pick up the, the completed movements and drop off some more brass and steel. So there was that sort of stuff going on, at least in one case that I know about. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was um, undoubtedly dozens of cases like that uh, as this thing really started to warm up and, and develop. I'm sure there were dozens of, of uh, journeymen and pockets of journeymen in different parts of New England. Now, how did Willard discover these clockmakers up in, you know, Somersworth, New Hampshire, or uh, um, up there in the north? They brought their cows up there in the summer because, you know, Boston was, was pretty developed by, by 1800, and they wanted to bring their cows so they could graze. Uh, and they would, um, and when I say they, I don't mean the Willards would walk their cows up to New Hampshire, but everybody had cows. 
So you want to understo- understand the story of, uh, of how clocks works. It, it's a bit like uh, a buddy of mine, David Newsom, told me. He says it's all about the cows in the world of Swiss watchmaking. <laughs> well, it's the same way about the clocks. They would run into these people because they're moving a whole herd of you know, cattle up to New Hampshire to graze for the spring through the summer. And they would develop these uh, uh, journeyman pockets that were essential to make that kind of quantity. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the, obviously this was a a business and they were making money. What is the kind of profits that they were making on this to have this, you know, such a large operation? Um, Simon Willard died with $500 to his name. Uh, Paul Revere died with $5,000 to his name. And I think that says that Paul Revere being a merchant was doing better than Simon Willard as a craftsman by a long shot. I've never been able to find any evidence of how uh, wealthy or not wealthy Aaron Willard was, but I suspect that he did pretty well with his sort of operation. Um, the operation that Simon ran, he was probably a fairly poor businessman or new to this whole uh, transatlantic commerce that was going on, and I suspect that he had a long way to go before he was making serious money. Uh, a clockmaker from the um, early 19th century from nearby Concord, Massachusetts, gave up clockwork because, oh, you can't make any money at it and began making um, lead pencils and became a rich man. So maybe all you had to do was change your trade and make something a little easier, less complicated, uh, become a broom maker, I guess. That would probably be the most obvious uh, easy trade to pick up. Uh, but um, I don't think it was highly profitable for Simon Willard, but it could have been for his brother, Aaron but I don't have any figures as to how well he did. <clears throat> what would become of all of the um, journeymen that you talk about and that they used throughout this process? Did they proceed onto being craftsmen or would they just continue doing kind of journeyman work throughout their life? Most of them uh, that have, uh, most, of the, most of the clockmakers uh, that we have discovered up until 2019, you know, we're kind of almost at the end of the real clockmakers, the people who would have a name on a dial and all of that. Um, So I I suspect that we'll continue to uh, find journeymen and journeymen in many, many uh, different states. Um, But they worked as journeymen their whole lives. Uh, Many of them, their names never appeared on a clock or a watch. That was just their trade. Uh, They would set up at home. Um, And really what we're describing here is a factory method, just not under one roof. It's a factory method under many roofs. And the uh, journeymen, I think, were just, uh, as far as I can tell, just content. Uh, one, One New Englander who was a journeyman uh, that I know of, spent his whole life cutting wheels. He owned a wheel-cutting engine, which was probably an expensive proposition, and he went from clockmaker to clockmaker around New England. He'd spend a week or two cutting wheels, and then go to the next clockmaker, another maker, and that was his whole life. So um, they tended not to be the businessmen. They tended to be just the workmen. Uh, so you said very briefly that cheap clocks from PA kind of ended this error? From Connecticut. Con- from Connecticut. Yeah. Uh, what, what was there happening? were cheap clocks in Pennsylvania, too. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> what, what was happening in Connecticut that made this a possibility and ended this, this era of watch, uh, clock making? Well, most notably, it was Eli Terry, uh, who in 1806 accepted an order to make uh, 4,000 wooden works clocks. You know why they call them woodenworks clocks, don't you? Uh, 
Mainly because they wouldn't work. You know, that's, <laughs> that's primarily why they call them that. But uh, so Eli Terry accepted this order to make 4,000 wooden clocks, and it took him a few years to, you know, set up the factory and get the whole process going. But setting up a factory system for making wooden clocks that were selling for three bucks. I mean, how can you compete with these things at 50 or $60? Even the most simple of uh, timepiece only from Willard was $10. You know, that was in the mid-18th century or last quarter of the 18th century. Was still well above, you know, what some of the uh, uh, the wooden clock makers were able to uh, produce over the course of the first quarter of the 19th century. Um, you know, it was uh, about 1840. Of course, this stuff had died out pretty much by 1840. But you know, by 1840, we had uh, clock makers, uh, clock manufacturers in Connecticut. Uh, most notably uh, Chauncey Jerome, who was making these so-called OG clocks. And, you know, he was making the whole deal, casing them up and everything, and sending them over to England. And on the shores of, of England, these things were selling for about $4. So you can't compete when you're making quality things like this with that sort of uh, industry. Robert, on the other end of the market, there were exceptional clocks. And the best example I can think of is the Rittenhouse clock. Right. I've never been able to wrap my mind out of how Rittenhouse had enough time to make this clock. So, Good for you. You're a thinker. Uh, I like that. If, <laughs> if you wanted to commission an exceptionally complicated piece, how much overlap was there? Would you go to the same suppliers who would also offer these Cadillac options or were there <clears throat> specialists that would work in that field? You mention a maker who is going to be getting a lot of attention over the next year. There's, uh, I understand, another project um, where Rittenhouse will be the subject of a, another rather large book, beautiful photographs and all that. And um, the notion has been up until this point that Rittenhouse was, you know, one of these geniuses who dropped down from heaven and just can do everything. You know, he can be a member of the Philadelphia uh, Philosophical Society, and he can design an ori and make an ori and make a musical clock. And any of those things that we're talking about, be it an ori, be it a musical clock, be you know, an uh, astronomical clock, all of that material was available over here. They didn't need to sit down and create an eight-day clock with an ori in it with ten other different functions, including music, without the assistance of Liverpool. Um, and I'm convinced of that. And I've seen in, in, I've seen in um, uh, Birmingham trade catalogs, you could buy nests of bells, you could buy drums with pins in them. So the uh, advent of making those complicated clocks, uh, if they wanted to make it the hard way, be my guess. But Rittenhouse was a very smart guy. And my guess is he, he made it a little bit easier way. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Glenn. Uh, very fascinating subject matter. I really enjoyed your uh, Thank you. your lecture here. Um, on this in this time period, all these watchmakers and clockmakers are they were they merely making uh, uh, this technology of clocks for local consumption, or or they were just mere copycats? of Europe, Europe, or did they really come up with something American that was innovative? Well, that's a good question, and being head of a museum. By the way, uh, when I first started talking about this subject, um, I was banned from the very museum that I now am director of. That's how unpopular this subject was. And um, 
it is a uh, it's an ongoing ongoing education for us uh, in this world. Um, but um, it was a lot of it was copycat. Maybe Willard's you know patent timepiece, the wall clock. Maybe that was a unique design. But there are some who claim that he was just copying the style of wheel barometers, for example. Um, there are some who have suggested uh, that he saw a um, uh, an Austrian wall clock and thought, gee, wouldn't that be a nice idea if I could make it this way or that way? Um, but I don't know that there's any uh, tremendous accomplishments by way of uh, new designs, new inventions done by Willard that has much to do with anything other than the decorative aspects of it. Uh, you know, prior to Willard, uh, there were not wall clocks with uh, Eglomise pianos, for example, uh, that are decorative pianos on top and midsection of these uh, wall clocks. Um, they were not clocks that size that fit neatly between the windows. Uh, so, so a lot of these accomplishments were, um, they were, they were in the decorative area rather than the serious horology area. Uh, I think we look to, to London and other places for, uh, in Switzerland for accomplishments in the serious horology era. Yes. Um, if we look at uh, the entire market of American clocks made by American makers, um, what percent of those do you have a sense were using completely homegrown components in the movements versus some portion of them coming from England or overseas? A tiny proportion. A tiny proportion made these the hard way. And um, I'm reminded of that every time I see another painted dial clock from in a very rural case. It looks like a case that was made in, you know, East Overshoe somewhere in New Hampshire. And I look at it and sure enough it's a recognizable clock set that could very well have been used by Simon Willard. So uh, I'm thinking uh, I can name probably five or six that worked in the traditional way, but uh, that's about it in my in my mind. Yes, sir. Um, the question was, what's more valuable, the homegrown stuff or the stuff that was made by, by this method? Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, well, the thing that these clocks have that none of the homegrown things have are these wonderful cases and beautiful dials. And, you know, if you want to get a divorce, one of the quickest ways to do that is to bring home one of these homegrown clocks and say, honey, look what I just bought. And they'll take one look at that and say, oh, my God, you're out of your mind. I'm not giving that house room. So, you know, those tend not to be terribly expensive. Uh, the ones that have brought the most money um, throughout the, uh, the ages of, of collectors, which is about 125 years now where, where these things have been collected, uh, they've been the... The most decorative clocks tend to bring the most money, unless it's something, you know, precision horology or some added uh, uh, outside um, accomplishment that is not recognized in the decorative world. What, we got lady with the uh, microphone. Oh, <laughs> were there any, um, during these early years, was there any decipherable difference in the quality of brass from one place to the other? Yes, definitely. When you're an American maker making clocks the hard way, you're a Daniel Burnap, you're a Thomas Harland, um, you can very often see difficulties in casting and getting a quality product. Um, some of these uh, more rural clocks, like um, like New Hampshire clocks, Vermont clocks, 
uh, they can look like, you know, gee, you threw a couple of brass pails in the in the melting, you know, bin and you came out with this really crummy brass that doesn't hold together well, has a lot of imperfections. This stuff, that is not the case. Every one of these castings is first rate, um, beautifully cast, just as you would expect from a finely divided trade. Uh, wasn't the American, uh, early American cl uh, gunsmiths similar to the clockmakers, American early clockmakers? They would get parts from Europe and, uh, you know. Yes, you're quite right. The gunsmiths, you know, there were gunsmiths working the hard way, and there were gunsmiths uh, working the business-like way. And they had the availability of components, you know, from other sources, and as a result, they could uh, um, make them however their business model, you know, might suit their, their own fancy. But gunsmiths are actually quite related to clocksmiths, you know, both metalworking trades. So our, our speaker's been very generous with his time. We'll take one or two more questions and call the formal meeting to a close. And then, of course, as we always do, we invite you to come up and say hello. And if you've got something you'd like to ask in private, if it's sure. okay with you. Okay. Uh, what would the uh, average customer who would purchase this variety of clock, what would they like look like? And how did that profile change when like the, the more inexpensive variety came out of Connecticut? Excellent question. Gee, where'd you get such a smart group? I, I'm not used to these questions. I'm going to have to go home and study some more. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, what did the customer of a clock like this look like? Uh, probably he's got my same waistline because, you know, he ate well. Uh, he was probably a merchant. Um, he uh, made plenty of money because these clocks at 50 or $60 dollars were a considerable investment um, when the average uh, wage uh, was something like 50 cents a day. Uh, so these were considerable investments. Um, but as clocks became less expensive during the Eli Terry era and you know later on with these uh, wooden clocks, it became a much more agrarian looking customer, more like a farmer and his wife as a customer rather than a merchant. Now, why farmers even needed clocks? I'm still grappling with that. You know, you have a rooster and you have the cows, they need to be milked. And, you know, th that's your own natural clock. You don't really need a clock if you're a farmer. Um, actually, you don't need a clock if you live in New York. You know, at 6 o'clock in the morning, bang, bang, beep, 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 you know, okay, I'm up. I don't need, the, need a clock to tell me it's, you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning living here. Uh, but it was the same way with, with the animals. They lived by the lifestyle of raising animals and doing farming. So that clientele was the 50 cents a day uh, if they were lucky kind of people. A lot of it was bartering back and forth, so they may not have even had cash in their hands. So I'm going to ask a final question. Um, now that you have a whole room full of people that want to have one of these clocks in their home, <laughs> uh, what advice can you give them as far as what to look for, where to find them, uh, and what to stay away from if there are fakes on the market? These clocks have been faked for a hundred years. And it's not just the ones we've seen here. Um, it's the other forms that Willard's made. Uh, the other forms that they made are smaller clocks. Smaller is easier to fake. If you're making, you know, one of one of uh, one of these uh, clocks, you. Um, you have a lot of old wood to find if you want to construct that case. So this is a difficult thing to fake. But if you're faking one of the smaller size clocks, you can utilize the um, tabletop from that Empire mahogany table that Grandma gave you that you never really liked. So you can cut that table up 
workmen use that for primary wood. The veneers are beautiful and all of that. So uh, you have to be very, very careful on the smaller clocks. But with these clocks, the hazards can be the dial can be repainted. The clock can, um, a, a, an eight-day clock like this generally loses its height. It loses the feet. It loses the top. Uh, is this a marriage? Was this clock and mechanism originally made for its, each other? Um, so these are considerations that require the help of a specialist. Uh, so, you know, naturally you should um, uh, enlist the help of a specialist or know your auctioneer well um, in order to make the right decisions if you're spending... Well, formerly this used to be a $75,000, $85,000 clock. It's probably more like fifty right now, so now's the time to buy. But um, by all means, uh, uh, if you don't have the expertise yourself, you should uh, ask for assistance from uh, someone who has had experience with it. Um, the uh, record for a patent timepiece that I know of uh, was about a quarter of a million dollars, so you can make a big mistake in that. Uh, the record for a Willard was something, a Willard like this was something like 400,000. So uh, that's a big mistake uh, if you uh, make one like that. Um, so you need to be very careful. Um, um, it, it's something buyer beware, a caveat emptor for sure. <laughs> I'm excited to announce our next lecture will feature Maria and Richard Habring. They're founders of the Habring Uhrentechnik. I'm not going to even try the rest of that in Austria. Uh, the next lecture will be Monday, October 7th, and I hope to see you all there. Have a good evening. Thank you, and good night.